So um, this is essentially an overview of uh, the most basic way of constructing um, invariants. The idea in this whole uh, program is to give uh, liftings of classical integral valued invariants like intersection numbers, Euler characteristics, counting curves, that type of thing, uh, to quadratic forms. So uh, let me begin by just uh, doing an abstract view of Euler characteristics, which most of you I'm sure are familiar with. So categorical Euler characteristics. So this is in uh, the setting of you have a symmetric monoidal category. And then you have an object X, which is, uh, has a dual. So that means a dual is a triple consisting of the dual of the object together with two maps, delta, I'll call them delta and epsilon, where delta is a map from the unit to X times X dual, and epsilon is a map in the other direction that satisfy some well-known properties, which I'll omit. And uh, for a typical example, just in case you haven't seen this before, I'll just do the very simplest example. We take C to just be uh, K vector spaces, K of field, and then X, if it's dualizable, it means it's a finite dimensional. A vector space, X dual is the usual dual. Of course, tensor is the usual tensor product over K. And then we have this, uh, the usual isomorphism, X tensor, X dual is then the endomorphisms of the vector space X. So you have the uh, delta is just the map sending, well, what's one, one is the field K as a vector space, and delta is the map, delta sends the one in K to the identity on X. And then the uh, epsilon, which is often called evaluation map for this reason, it's the evaluation map, right? If you have a linear function F and a vector V, this goes to F of V, F of V. Okay, so in this situation, then, uh, so this is just a little aside. If you have a dual, an object which is dualizable, if it has a dual, then you have the Euler characteristic, the categorical Euler characteristic in the endomorphism ring of the unit, which is just the following composition. You take the diagonal map, delta, you switch factors for some funny reason, and then you take the evaluation map epsilon. So that's the thing. So in our example, the Euler characteristic in vector spaces of a finite dimensional vector space is just the dimension. But really in the endomorphism ring, the endomorphism ring of K is K. So it's this, uh, the dimension times the identity on K. All right, good. So um, let me make a broad and false statement that all, not quite all, all familiar Euler characteristics arise this way. There's a, maybe someone will tell me the one example that comes to mind that's my, don't see immediately of this form is the universal Euler characteristic on varieties over K, K naught var. So I don't know if it arises that way. Maybe it does. Somebody can probably tell me later. Okay. So, um, you know, for example, the, the usual suspects are, um, well, if we go from, say, a homological complex in, uh, of abelian groups, then it's actually will be dualizable means it's uh, perfect. We assume it's perfect then it's dualizable. So equivalent to a finite complex of um, free abelian groups and then a, a finite, finitely generated free abelian groups. 
And then the Euler characteristic is just the usual alternating sum of the ranks as Z modules of the homology. And the alternating sum that's, that's sort of interesting, the minus one comes from the tau in the tensor category of complexes of abelian groups. That's where the minus sign comes in. And then uh, if you have C, a um, CW complex, which is, it should be then finite, that's the dualizable condition or equivalent to something finite, then you have the Euler characteristic is just the topological Euler characteristic, which is the ranks of the homology. And of course, uh, this is of course just induced by sending CW complexes to the derived category of abelian groups by taking the singular chain complex, for example. And then we can take uh, X, a uh, finite type K scheme, and then we have the etal Euler characteristic of X, which is the same thing where you just take the say dimension or say QL, L prime to the characteristic of K of X over K bar, sorry, H I etal, nobody can read this, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, and, Mark, I, I, have a, I have a question, but it's yes. just an, uh, uh, an organization question. Can you make the, the, the pages scrolling instead of passing from one another? Uh, is, it, is it possible with your... Sure, I can do that. Is that better? Sure, how's that? Yeah, that, that's better, thanks. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so um, yeah. And of course, in, in these two cases, we also have, let me just put on the side, we also have the same thing with compact supports. Just replacing uh, the homology uh, with cohomology with compact supports and the same with a tau cohomology. So um, we'd like to get a refinement of this. One thing you could try and do is you could take motives. So if you take geometric motives over a field, this is, and so an object here would be dualizable, for example, if you have X uh, smooth scheme over K, and maybe you have to invert the uh, characteristic due to problems with resolutions and singularities, then you get the motive of X in here, and this will be dualizable. But um, if you take the Euler characteristic of the motive, well, this lives in N of z of zero, which is again z. So you don't get anything new here, you just get these things back again. Um, but uh, the interesting story is now we take, so here's the, this is all lead in to the, we take our symmetric monoidal category C to be um, the motivic homotopy category over some nice base S. We usually Make S to be a spec of some perfect field, but uh, for a while we can just forget that. And then we have um, these objects. If we take X to be a smooth variety over S, smooth scheme over S for finite type, let's even assume uh, quasi projective for my own personal reasons. Then um, you have this motive in here. So, what is this? I'm going to introduce. Uh, this um, four functor formalism in a bit. So one way to view this is uh, it's a infinite, it's a suspension spectrum, T suspension spectrum, but another way without writing that, you take the structure of morphism, PX, you take this lower sharp thing of one on X. So I'll explain what this is in a minute. And then you can even do this for um, just a quasi projective S scheme Z, and you have its motive with compact support. This will be the structure morphism with an exceptional push forward applied to one on Z. Uh, and this should be, of course, Z, not X. And um, certainly if, if S is a field of characteristic zero, these are dualizable objects. And if it's a perfect field, then I think uh, due to Ryu, if you invert the uh, characteristic, then they're also dualizable. So let's say uh, usually dualizable. So in this case, these are usually mostly dualizable. 
One case where there's absolutely no problem is if you assume that uh, X is smooth and projective over S, then it's dualizable without any real um, restriction. It doesn't have to be a field anymore. Okay, in any case, then you get these categorical Euler characters, which I'll write in this fashion. And this lives, uh, now we take, well, if I take this over S, this will live in the endomorphism ring of the unit object in S. And the same thing for the thing with compact supports. Also in there. But note, uh, in case S equals spec K, K perfect field, then we have the theorem of Morel, which tells us what this endomorphism ring, well, I guess maybe characteristic not equals two. I think he, he claims this in characteristic two also, but let me just uh, sweep that under the rug. If you take um, the endomorphisms of one here, this is isomorphic to the grotendieck witt ring of non-degenerate um, symmetric bilinear forms over K, where you, of course, group complete with respect to orthogonal direct sum. You do the grotendieck witt ring. Okay, so that's, that's the, you get these interesting gadgets here living in here in case you have um, S spec of a field. And in general, you still get interesting gadgets in S and then you can try and study them. Okay, so um, the basic theme, I'll, say, I'll tell you something about the various properties of these gadgets and uh, say a little bit more about the four plus functor formalism that uh, I've already used here. And then I'll explain a bit about, um, a little bit more about how you get these things to be, uh, dual, to have duals. And then um, how you can try and compute these uh, Euler characteristics. So the computation will use, um, eventually will come the end to this uh, really nice theorem of uh, De Glis, uh, Jin, and Kahn. Uh, it's a motivic version of the classical gauss bonnet formula. And uh, in order to get to that, we have to talk about uh, all those things. And in order to make computations with it, we also need to specialize to theories which have orientation. So um, I'll try and fit that all in. That's the, more or less the program. Okay, so maybe I pass to the next page in spite of scrolling. Okay, so here's the, the next topic is duality. Nope. Let's see, some properties, so I'll turn my page. Some properties. These, let's just do the case of a field. Compact support one. Okay, so first of all, if um, you take X, which is smooth over K and projective or proper, then well, I guess this is true over any S, then the guy with compact supports is the same as the original one, or without compact supports. That's actually easy to prove. Um, this is also true uh, of general S. Okay, but um, one interesting thing, which I don't know how to prove, um, over general S, if the uh, dimension of X is odd, then this Euler characteristic is a multiple of the hyperbolic form. So H is the, the one H of XY equals XY, or if you like, X squared minus Y squared for characteristic not, not two. Okay, so this, that's the sort of form that everybody understands and is sort of trivial. You get rid of this H if you pass from the Grotendieck bit ring to the bit ring. So it says that this is just a trivial gadget in the odd dimensional case. So the first computation that I know of was due to Mark Hoyla, who showed using a Lefschetz uh, uh, trace formula that the Euler characteristic of Pn, I think over an arbitrary um, base, is the following. Um, it's equal to uh, x 
explain the notation in a minute. So we've already one plus n over two times h. This is as n is even. And uh, just n plus one over two times h if n is odd. So I've already explained what h is, this form. If you have u, a unit in the field, this form u is the form x, the one dimensional form x goes to ux squared. So as a quadratic form or as a bilinear form, it's xy goes to u times x times y. Okay, so that's the first computation. And I think at the beginning, that was really the only uh, thing that uh, anyone could compute. It was even a question. So this thing about thing being odd that came that came much later. It was even a question of what is the Euler characteristic of a severi Brouwer variety. So I'll just mention that. If you take um, x over k, a severi Brouwer variety of dimension n, then the Euler characteristic of x is the same as the Euler characteristic of projective space. So uh, not so interesting, but actually this, this follows from these two facts we mentioned before, because if n is odd, then we know it's hyperbolic, which is the odd case for projective space. And if n is even, then, um, then you can split the severi Brouwer variety by an odd dimensional uh, field extension. And that is fairly, the golden big bit ring is fairly ins insensitive to that. So you can basically reduce that. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh yeah. Um, let's see. And why, why is this true? Well, that's pretty easy. That's just because the Euler characteristic of X over K is this categorical Euler characteristic of um, the motive, but this is the same as the categorical Euler characteristic of the dual of this motive. That's just a formality in any symmetric monodal category. And as we'll see in a minute, this is the same for dual is the motive with compact supports. So we'll see that in a minute. This is later. Okay. So um, now this Euler characteristic of compact supports is actually interesting from the following point of view. I had mentioned briefly this universal Euler characteristic K naught var K. I'm not gonna say anything more about this. If you know what this is, then fine. If not, then just ignore me for a minute. And this extends to, a, or descends to a ring homomorphism from K naught var to the Grotendieck bit ring, so the so called motivic measure. So you can use computations here, which are often very difficult, but some, some interesting ones, a lot of interesting ones have been made to make computations here. All right, so uh, let's go on. I want to talk about four plus functors. Depends how you count them. So what's the situation? If we fix, we fix our base base scheme S, then we can send X an S scheme to the motivic stable homotopy category uh, over X. And this defines a functor from say, nice, I'll say finite type or quasi-projective, whichever you like, contravariant functor to triangulated categories. Of course, uh, this has liftings to infinity categories, but we won't need that. So um, in other words, we have, for, we have this guy, and if we have a map f from x to y, then we get a pullback map, that's the contravariant functoriality from sh of y to sh of x. And this functor has an adjoint. So um, we have a adjoint pair, F lower star, F lower star goes in the other direction. And also um, in case F is smooth, 
there's another functor, which is left adjoint to the f upper star. So again, a covariant functor. And this is the one I use to describe uh, the motive of x by taking x smooth over s and then just taking the pushboard of the unit with respect to this lower sharp gadget for the structure. Um, Mark, there's a question okay. about compatibility of uh, characteristic, earlier characteristic and base extension. So I, I, I guess it's uh, compatibility with pullbacks. So we well, any, it's compatible with any symmetric monoidal functor. So when pullbacks are um, symmetric yeah. monoidal, so yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, so that's, those are those guys. That's if F is smooth, we have this uh, left adjoint. And in general, we have the exceptional adjoint pair, um, F lower shriek, F upper shriek. And again, if F is smooth, well, you can compute the thing. So, uh, well, we'll have to get to that in a second. But this leads, to the following gadget, if you have v to x, uh, a vector bundle, then you have this suspension operator, which is, so here's the projection p, and then you have the zero section s, which I'm sorry, probably can't read that, it's too small, but you call it s, the zero section. So uh, what do you do? You take um, s lower star, and then p lower sharp, p is smooth. So you can do that. And you also have um, its adjoint, which is the same as its inverse, which is um, S upper shriek, the upper star. So this is actually an invertible gadget, and this extends to a, this suspension map from the K theory space of X to endomorphisms of the triangulated symmetric monoidal category, or the triangulated category SH of X. Okay, so, um, and now I just wanted to say if F is smooth, then we have all these functors. We have this lower sharp and this upper shriek and the upper star and the upper shriek, and they're all related, then, um, F lower shriek is the same as F lower sharp composed with suspension with respect to minus the relative tangent bundle for F. So it's the kernel of the map on the tangent bundles. And F upper shriek is similarly you suspend with respect to this guy composed with F upper star. So they're all related in the smooth case. Okay, and um, so let's see. So, ah, uh, yeah, and there's another uh, bunch of list of things I was supposed to tell you. One other thing is you have the one you can phrase morel voivodsky morel voivodsky purity theorem in this language. It says if you have a closed immersion of smooth gadgets over smooth schemes over S, then that gives you an isomorphism of you can take the structure push forward with respect to the structure morphism composed with the inclusion map. And that's the same thing as pushing forward uh, with respect to the original guy, but first pre-composing with the suspension operator with respect to the normal bundle of Z in X. So is that how, that's what I meant, or maybe I should, maybe you write that the other way. The normal bundle of Z and X, I'll just write it this way, Z and X, so there's no confusion. All right, and uh, that's a statement from Mor morel Voivodsky, purity, and um, you also have, if you send X goes to this MX, which is, I already described, it's PX or sharp of one on X, defines a functor M, from uh, smooth things over S to the homotopy category. So if you have a map of schemes, it induces a map on the motives and Z going to the gadget with compact support, which is this guy here, extends to a functor. This, this uses a little more work, MC, 
Well, where does it go? You take schemes of finite, say, your favorite finite type category, but you restrict to the subcategory of projective morphisms, and then it's contravariantly functorial. So if I have time, I'll explain how you do that, but let's just, let's just say, so it means if you have, you know, F from Z to W proper, then that induces F star from the motive complex support of W to the motive complex support in Z. It's not so hard to construct that, but let me just avoid it. All right, so that brings us to uh, duality. How do we get duality in SH? Well, uh, let's take X to be smooth. So I'm gonna refer to this to Mark Hoywa's paper. This was of course uh, done in various forms by a lot of other people, starting with Voyevodsky, then Hu, then a lot of other people. Uh, Ryu uh, did a lot of work on this, but I think the nicest and most complete form uh, is, is in Hoywa. That's the nicest one I know. So if we take X to be smooth and proper over S, and um, then the statement, which is uh, mentioned that this motive of X is dualizable and it's dual, is the mode of the compact supports. So how is this? We have to define these maps delta should go from the unit to, um, so the, you write the tensor operation as wedge due to topological bias. So how do you do this? Well, you first have the map. Well, this is a proper map. So we can take PX, upper star going to the motive with compact support on X, right? We have a pullback map uh, for proper morphisms. Okay, and um, now what is this thing? This guy here, uh, this is this hot PX lower shriek of one on X, but P is also smooth. So this is PX lower sharp of suspension by minus the tangent bundle of x over s, let me just avoid the over s on one on x. All right, and this thing here is the same thing that the smash product here comes from just product on x. So what you've done here is you, um, if you like, in the first variable, you're just taking the px lower sharp. The second variable, you're taking the px lower shriek, but that's the same thing as just twisting by the minus the tangent bundle. So this smash product is really equal to P X cross X lower sharp of you suspend by minus P two star of the tangent bundle on X one on X cross X. And then from that description, you see that the usual diagonal map from X into the product gives you a map here. So I'll just call that, that's the usual map induced by the map on the usual motives, but twisted by this uh, minus the tangent bundle. So that's delta, right? So we're supposed to get a map that way. And what's the epsilon? The epsilon uh, works for any smooth variety, smooth S scheme. So um, let's see, so here we have MC of X smash M of X. And the same thing I said before works here, except those factors get switched. So this is just, the suspension of uh, minus P1 star with a tangent bundle of X, apply to one. Okay, and um, so now we can use morel voivodsky purity. And I should have said something, there's, well, there's also, um, through the adjoint property, we have um, the adjoint property gives us a map from the identity on the um, SH of X cross X to um, delta lower star, delta upper star, just using the adjoint property of delta. Delta is the diagonal map from X into X cross X. And we combine that with uh, the morel voivodsky purity isomorphism. And you see, you get a map of this, this gadget here to the following thing, it's just uh, Px 
little more sharp, but this is viewing x's by the diagonal of what? We have to twist this guy here, of course, pulled back to x, so it just becomes the tangent bundle again, by the normal bundle of the diagonal inside the product. Y to one on x. Okay, but as we all know, uh, the normal bundle of the diagonal inside the product of x with itself is just equal to the tangent bundle. So we're ended up with, with no twisting. So this thing here is just equal to the motive of x. That's because x is smooth, we have a tangent bundle, right? And then we have the usual push forward map by the covariant functoriality of this motive operation to the motive of s, which is just the one on s. So that's the map epsilon x. So those are the two structures and Hoywa's theorem is It says that MCX together with this delta X and epsilon X is a dual. So A means up to unique isomorphism is a dual of MX. All right. Oh, and moreover, maybe I should just say, and once you have a dual, you can also take duals of maps. It gives a duality on maps between dualizable objects. And the, this map, px star, which was defined here, is actually just the dual of px lower star. Okay, so let's see. Um, that brings us to, oh, I think I'm doing okay for time. That brings us to the next topic, orientations. Okay, so if we have an object in my stable homotopy category, besides, let's just, um, I think I'll just work, well, can I work over S? Let's see how it goes, work over S. Let's assume that this is, this represents a cohomology theory, which means it should be a commutative ring object. So it has a mul commutative multiplication in the category and it has a unit object, a unit morphism from the one. And then if you have such a gadget, I said it's a cohomology theory, what's the cohomology? It's a bi-graded cohomology on some object. It's just a hom in the category into, well, you have this two variable family of suspensions. I'm not gonna to say too much about that. You probably all know about it, but this is just um, two variables where, um, this corresponds to taking smash product with S, the usual sphere to the A minus B, smash with the GM to the B. Assuming that A is bigger than or equal to B is, and B is bigger than or equal to zero, and then you've inverted enough things in here to make this make sense for all A and B. Good, so that's a quick and dirty description of what this uh, cohomology theory is represented by a commutative ring object in the category. So what's an orientation? For E um, is the assignment of Tom classes for vector bundles. In other words, if you have V to X vector bundle of rank R, then you should have um, an element, the Tom class in, so I'm assuming here X, let's, let's just restrict the X being smooth over S. You have an element in the E cohomology of this Tom space of V, where the Tom space of V is, well, I guess I didn't really define this, right? This is uh, the P X shriek of the suspension of one on X. What, I mean, more concretely, it's just you take V modulo V minus the um, zero section viewed as an object over S, the same thing. Okay, that um, satisfies certain properties. 
satisfying blah, 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 which I'm not gonna tell you. But the upshot is, is this leads to a uh, tom isomorphism. We call it theta V, which goes from the E cohomology of your X to the E cohomology with a shift on the tom space of V. And what you do is you take an element here, X, and then you can pull it back to V and then take the cup product with this thing here. There's, there's a cup product from the cohomology of V and cohomology of the tom space of V to the cohomology of the tom space of V. In here, so that's an isomorphism. And uh, the conditions that the Tom classes have to satisfy say that um, in case that the vector bundle is trivial, it's just the suspension isomorphism. All right, so that's an orientation and we have other flavors of this thing. So what's an SL orientation or even more general, an SLC orientation is the same kind of thing, except you require a bit more rigidity, is the assignment for each V, you have a V as above, plus an isomorphism of the determinant of V with the trivial bundle, or in the SLC orientation case, you relax this a little bit, this is an isomorphism of determinant of V with the square of some invertible sheaf, then you get a Tom class and where does this live? Um, yeah, it lives in the same place. Okay, and induces Tom isomorphisms in the same way. Okay, so that's a brief description. Now, what are what good are these? Well, these are good for defining uh, Giessen maps or push forward maps. Just by identifying, in some sense, the. Um, let's see, so how am I doing here? Oh, I think I'll probably get to the end. Okay, so. Um, how do you do this? Well, you take, if you have F from Y to X, let's say smooth over S, but this is proper, then we already have this F upper star from um, PX or shriek one on X, that's the motive with compact support, PY lower shriek one on Y, but this thing is the same thing as PX or sharp, right? minus the tangent bundle of x. And this thing is py or sharp minus tangent bundle on y. So you see if you have, so this induce maps on the hom into your e. So if e is oriented, e has an orientation, then the f upper star induces the f upper star upper star, which we'll call f lower star, it will go from um, um, E A B of X to E A minus 2D, E minus D of Y, where D here is the relative dimension of F. And if uh, E is only SL or SLC oriented, then um, you get the same kind of thing. Um, you get F lower star, but now you'd have to take, a, well, let's, let's look at the SLC oriented case, it's a more general case. It gives you um, a push forward map. If you twist, I have to say what this thing is, if you can twist your theory 
by the relative dualizing sheet, the top wedge of the differentials, you have some Y bundle L on Y it does the same thing A minus 2D, B minus D on Y twisted by omega Y S tensor L. Where here, the theory on some Z, say, twisted by some invertible sheet M means you take the theory on the Tom space of M for M an invertible sheet. So you have to trace this out, but that turns out to work. And now um, you have the general case, which is, um, I think first appeared in the work of um, Degrees, Jin and Khan, where you just say, I mean, you just use this. You just denote the theory to just say you're just doing this here. You define E A B of let's say X with respect to a vector bundle of rank R to be E A plus two R, E plus R of the Tom space of V. And you extend it to virtual bundles um, in a fairly formal way. And so you get in this notation, it's in this sense, it's more or less notation, except you have to make sense of it. You get F lower star going from E A B of X minus the tangent bundle of X going to E A plus, uh, sorry, the tangent bundle of F. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, just a remark, the F lower star should go from E, A, B, Y to E, A minus D. Oh, D. yeah, I got everything That's else. It. So let me just change this here. <laughs> That's it. Sorry, sorry. That was no yeah, problem. I knew I, I, knew I was going to do that. Thank you very much. And this should be then, yeah, this should be the Y. Sorry. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Confusing everybody here. Thank you, sorry about that. Okay, so um, you're right, so something, or if you like, maybe I should just stick with it. Okay, so that's the general case. All right, so let's see. Um, I'm kind of running out of time, so let me just um, I'll come to the ex interesting examples in a second. So I have to say something about Euler classes. Well, I mean, now more or less it's, it's formal. If you take V, a vector bundle with zero section S, rank of V equals R, then you have the Euler class in your cohomology theory E of V is just S upper star, S lower star of one on X. And where this lives depends on, you know, in general, it will live in this. That's the general case, but this will specialize to this. in the SL oriented case, and we'll specialize to perhaps the more familiar guy here, whoops, sorry about that, in the oriented case. Okay, but the formula is the same. So, and then finally we have, uh, we wanna compute, we wanna count things, so we need the degree maps. And what's that? Um, well, we can consider this if you have now X, it's, it's just, the, just the dual of the, put, of the pullback. If you have X over S smooth and projective, then um, if you like, you have the degree map going from your theory, let's say a relative dimension D and it goes from E to D, D of X 
minus the tangent bundle of x. This is just equal to, this is my structure map px, is just px lower star. Okay, right, and of course, again, this specializes in the SL oriented case, this specializes to, again, this determinant inverse of this, but this is, of course, just the dualizing sheet going to the same thing. And in the, this is the SL oriented case. And in the oriented case, this is just without any decoration. Okay, so this, this last one is the usual degree map that you see from things like uh, Chow groups or K theory. Um, good. So in particular, we have, uh, even in the most general setting, we have the Euler class of the tangent bundle of X. This lives in H to D D of X minus the tangent bundle of X. So then we can apply the degree map to it to get this degree of the Euler class in, well, not H, that was a, that was a misnomer. And I, let's get rid of that. In e, sorry, and this lives in E zero zero of my base scheme S. Okay, so now um, yeah, we're doing, doing good. So now we have all the ingredients to describe state the motivic Gauss Bonnet theorem. This is uh, due to De Glis, Jim, Kahn. So it says that we take X over S smooth and proper. Then coming back to our Euler characteristic, this motivic O over S is just equal to the degree of the Euler class of the tangent bundle in which theory in the unit theory. So this is living in one zero zero of one, well of S. But this is just N of one. So it's living in the right place. They all live in the right place. And since I have a few minutes, I mean, the, the proof is actually so you still have 10 minutes because we, we started uh, five minutes late. Ah, great. Sorry, I okay, should so plenty, plenty of time. Thanks very much. So um, let me give a quick, in spite of that, I'll only give a sketch of the proof. The main idea. It's just you have to reorganize the definition. Well, the first thing is a trivial reduction. It's, um, of course, the definition of this Euler characteristic is you have this composition of these maps. You take, uh, what do you do? First you take delta, then you compose with this twist map, and then you compose with epsilon, okay? But this is, this is a map from 1s to 1s. But now if you apply, of course, if you're, you know, you have a ring and you multiply by an element in the ring, it's the same as the, does the same thing on maps of the ring to itself. So if you apply HOM into 1S, which is, now I'm thinking of this as my E, then that says that this Euler characteristic here is just gotten by applying these maps to the unit in, right? Okay, so in other words, let me just say it. It's equal to delta X star composed with tau star equals with epsilon like star applied to the identity on one on S, which I'll just call one. Okay, so what, what is that? Let's see. Well, let's remind ourselves, well, what's delta? Remember delta was this guy here. This goes into MX times its dual, which is the MC. 
And um, how was this constructed? We took the dual of the structure map going into here. And then we applied the diagonal map. Okay, then we take tau that switches things. Of course, this thing here, remember, um, this was this was equal to px over sharp of minus tangent bundle of x of one, but this is just the tom space. This is just the tom space of minus the tangent bundle. Okay, and we still have a similar delta here. And since delta doesn't lives in the diagonal, doesn't care about the tau. So now what's this thing here? Remember this guy here was the tom space, if you like, of minus P2 star of the tangent bundle of X. And so this guy here is the tom space of minus P1 star of the tangent bundle of X. Okay. So that was uh, delta, that's tau, and now what about epsilon? So remember how we did this, we applied morel boyevatsky purity to the uh, unit, of, unit of the adjunction. It's the unit. So what did this go to? Remember this went to this thing, which was the tom space of it was really minus the tangent bundle plus the normal bundle, but this cancels out. And the canceling out is the Tom, the canonical Tom isomorphism for X going just to um, the motive of X. If you think about it for a minute. This is, this thing here is, you know, this is, well, okay. This is really the, well, I think I skipped this step here. Sorry, let me go back a little bit. We'll think about this thing. You think, let's think of the Tom space. This is, you can think of this as you take the Tom space. Let's just cheat a little bit here. This is like taking the Tom space of the normal bundle of X, where I view the normal bundle of X as a bundle on the Tom space of minus the tangent bundle of X. Supposed to be. So, this is a bit of, a bit of a stretch, but um, that's a nice way to think about it. Now, if you think about it that way, what have we got? Well, here we have this space, the Tom space of minus the tangent bundle, and we're taking delta x into here. This is really just the zero section induced by the zero section of the normal bundle viewed as a bundle over the Tom space of minus the tangent bundle of x. So that's my s. Should be inserted here. And now this thing by the Tom, the canonical Tom isomorphism is isomorphic to Mx. So I'm still describing epsilon. And now to get epsilon, then at the end, I apply the push forward here back to one on S. So let's see, it's a little messy here, but this whole gadget here is the epsilon. All right, so let's try it. What is here? This is the guy we want to calculate. What is delta x star? Oh, I still have a few minutes. Tau star epsilon star of one. Well, that's the same thing here, delta x star. Tau star. Well, the same thing. Ooh. I didn't want to do that. Come back. Whew, that was close. This is the same thing as, well, if I, I follow it this way here. So this is the same thing as I take PX star of one. So that's one on X. In other words, it's one X. Then I take theta of that. That's the Tom class. So what is this? This Tom class is just S zero lower star of one on X. And then I take S zero upper star of it. That's the Euler class, right? With respect 
the Euler class of the tangent bundle on X. And then, oh, then I take PX dual of it, which is just the degree. So there you are. That's, that's the sketch of the proof. Okay. So uh, there is a question about the, so the classical ghost bonnet formula relates curvature to Euler characteristic and the, 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 the questioner wants to know the intuitive interpretation of the algebraic analog. Is well, the curvature like we view as representing the, the Euler class in the topological sense. So that's the connection. So the curvature, right, you integrate the curvature. The curvature is, you can view as a cohomology class representing the Euler class of the tangent bundle if you put a metric on it by the Tia, who, who does this, what's it called? Help me out, Griff. I think that's, yeah, that's it. The, the degree is the integral of the... Yeah, so and then this the is degree the, is the pushboard. That's the integral of the top of the Euler, of the Euler class. class. And the Euler class is represented by the curvature. Okay. So it's a kind of quadratic curvature. Right, exactly. Okay, so that's the theorem. Now, let me give, here's an application. It's a theorem to myself and Arpan Raxit, which uh, says the following, let's say, now let's take X over K smooth. I think we only prove it in the projective case, but probably works in the proper case. Then the Euler characteristic of X over K is the following explicit quadratic form. You take, um, you, to phrase it most nicely, you should work in the derived category. So I take these Hodge cohomology groups I view this guy in degree um, i minus j, so I apply the shift, and I take the direct sum over all i and j. Of course, going just between zero and the, so let's say d equals the dimension of x. Okay, then I need a quadratic form. So the quadratic form q is as follows, where q is gotten by taking Take H I X omega J tensor with H D minus I X omega D minus J so Fortunately the degrees cancel out. I take the cup product, this goes into H D on X omega D, and then I have a trace map here. So of course, this is the familiar omega x over k. I have the trace map to k. So that gives me the quadratic form. And uh, let me say one word about the proof, so I'm almost out of, out of time. You apply the motivic Gauss-Bonnet formula to the case E equals ko. Uh, Hermitian K theory. So the point is the unit map from one on K to KO. So this is this is living in GW of K. Induces an isomorphism from GW of K, that's the endomorphisms of the unit by Morel's theorem, to KO of K in degree zero, zero. So you can compute so here's where our Euler characteristic lives, and you can compute it here by applying U to it. And then you use the um, work of Kames and Hornbostel, which give uh, sort of explicit formulas for all these push forwards. Okay, so um, and let me just conclude by saying, um, as far as I can tell, recent work of um, Bachmann and Wickelgren have extended this to work over um, an arbitrary base where you just assume that two is invariant. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, thanks for that, Mark. So I don't know how everyone applauds, probably. 
Uh, <laughs> I'll take it as given. <laughs> so, so I'll start with a question uh, that was asking before. So it's about the the application of this formalism of other characteristic formula to braided monoidal categories, which are some weakening of symmetric monoidal categories. If I Oh, uh -huh. And so the question is, uh, is this case relevant to the motivic case? Hmm, no idea. I don't know. Um, is there an Euler characteristic in the braided? So set? I guess it's, okay. I guess it's the question. So you need to, I mean, is there, uh, I don't, I don't know anything about it. I don't know if there's a nice theory of dualizable objects and, um, I suppose, I mean, there must be traces, traces in those cases, right? I assume. So uh, maybe the person who asked the question could respond and uh, let me know what the story is. But it, it could be interesting if you could um, sort of refine SH to have this braided structure. Maybe that would explain something. There is an interesting um, situation going on where I'm looking for something that um, makes GW more complicated because there are interesting formulas for uh, these Euler characteristics. I mentioned the universal um, Euler characteristic, um, K naught var, and there's interesting work um, of um, um, uh, Gutsche and Shenda, I think, who define an interesting Euler characteristic um, with values, you know, it's from the Hodge polynomial. Right, so it has a variable in there, and it would be nice. It has the property that when you, um, which I should have mentioned for these Euler characteristics, one nice thing about these Euler characteristics is when you take the rank for the Euler characteristics of x over k, you get the usual topological Euler characteristic. Yeah. And if k embeds into the reals, then the uh, induced signature function on the Euler characteristic gives you the Euler characteristic of the real points. And these Gutsche Shenda. Um, Hodge polynomials, I believe, maybe I got that wrong, but there's polynomials with a variable in them. And when you evaluate at one, you get the topological Euler characteristic. At minus one, you get the real the Euler characteristic of the real points. And so it would be very interesting to be able to refine these motivic constructions to end up with something living in uh, something where you have a variable and evaluating at minus one corresponds to taking a signature of some quadratic form and evaluating at one corresponds to the rank. The present, this doesn't exist. And maybe in this framework of uh, braided symmetric monoidal categories, such a thing could exist. I don't know. Okay. So I guess that answers the question. So I have another question So in, uh, that I read. So in topology, if a vector bundles E admits a sub-bundle of odd rank, we have two times the Euler class is zero. Do we have an analog for motivic Euler classes? With eta oh, maybe it's a sub bundle. Yeah, sure. Because yeah, there's a there's a theorem that says, well, there's an analog. It's not it's not zero. What it is is the following. So you can pass like let's look at KO. And um, let's see. I prove I'm pretty sure this is true. Let's let's look at the simplest situation, where um, one nice theory, which still gives you the quadratic Euler characteristics is by taking uh, x, you look at the cohomology of x with coefficients in the um, milner witt k groups. So this thing specializes to the cohomology of x in the Milner k groups. So, and this thing, but for example, you have this block formula. This is just chow n. And here, the Euler characteristic of v of rank r just becomes the top churn class of V. But here you have this lifting of V and it will specialize to this, but will also have quadratic information. And here the theorem is that if uh, the rank of V is odd, then you have this element in here, eta, which sort of gives you the kernel of this map. Then eta times this Euler characteristic of V is zero. This is like eta is like multiplying by two. And now when you invert eta, then this gives you a class 
in the vit ring cohomology. If you take this, this guy here and invert eta, you get the sheaf of vit rings. And what that says is this guy here, if you take the vit ring valued Euler class, this is equal to zero if the rank of V is odd. And now the Euler class in um, short exact sequences, I guess, is multiplicative. So that will tell you that the, you have the same theorem. That after inverting eta, and I'm not sure if this is true in any theory after inverting eta, it could, could very well be. I'm kind of blanking on that, but I know it's at least true in this theory that if you um, invert eta from this very nice theory here, then uh, that same theorem is true. Okay, thanks. And there's a uh, comment. E e how about the converse of this property? Which property? If we have this vanishing, maybe in the, in the, the cohomology of a V chief, then what can we say? Ah, well, that's, that's a very, I mean, that's uh, the Euler classes in here have been extensively studied to uh, ask questions about splitting of vector bundles. So, um, I mean, this goes back in here, looking at the churn classes, there's a um, long uh, study by Murti and many others that um, if you work over an algebraically closed field and you have a vector bundle on an affine, smooth affine X of dimension D and the vector bundle has rank D, then it splits off a trivial sum and if and only if the top churn class mm. is zero. And uh, then this was extended by many people, but I think the most definitive version is now due to Krishna, where works over an algebraic and closed field over an affine X, but you don't assume that it's uh, smooth or anything. And you get the same result where you have to say what, what the child group is. You replace this with a certain Euler class group. And the Euler class group, I think is closely, in general, is closely related to this. Now you ask what happens over a non-algebraically closed field, and uh, this question has been answered, and I don't know exact state of affairs in what generality it's, it's true, but this, this type of group here was used by Asok and uh, Fazel to answer the similar type of splitting question over non-algebraically closed field. So you have to look at their work to see exactly what the state of that is. Okay, thanks. So we have other questions. So uh, the one question is that the construction of refined Euler characteristic in Hodge theory depends on the resolution of singularities. And the question is how are we doing that in characteristic P? Uh, we're only talking about smooth projective varieties. I, mean, I don't know, refined in the sense of the quadratic refined. Is that what the question is about? I'm not sure if this is an anonymous uh, so question. In this case, in this case um, you really don't need resolution of singularities because we're taking X to be smooth and projective. Yeah. So we don't need, um, we don't need a nice theory of Hodge cohomology on smooth varieties to do this. The way this goes is by working entirely with Hermitian K theory and then you, this result of um, Kalmay's Hornbostel is saying when you, I didn't tell you what the um, orient, see this KO theory, I you know, ran out of time. So the KO theory is SLC oriented. And you can write down explicitly what the Todd classes are. Um, for K theory, the Todd class, uh, I mean Tom class, the Tom class for K theory for a vector bundle is just the, Zool complex you get by taking the canonical uh, section of the vector bundle. And you have a similar story for KO theory. You take the Kazool complex and just the usual map of wedge I of a vector space and wedge R minus I of the vector space of the vector space had dimension R into the determinant gives you the quadratic form. And then the problem in this theorem is that that tells you essentially what the um, orientations here are. And then you have to just, and th that was used by Kalmes and Hornbostel together with Grotendieck duality theory to tell you what this push forward is. And then the, the only real problem here is to say this explicit formula is the one given by the general theory once we have these orientations. And so that's essentially a calculation since you know what the, what the KO theory is after you invert eta for a projective space, I think of, e of odd dimension. 
So that's how the proof here goes. And then the extension by uh, Bickelgren and Bachmann is uh, saying, okay, we do this in a fancier way using, um, using uh, frame correspondences and constructing spectra that way. But I think the idea is roughly the same. You basically have to get an idea of an explicit formula for this push forward map from a projective space down to the base. But you never use Hodge cohomology as a cohomology theory directly. It just comes in because that was what arises in looking at what the Euler class is in KO theory. Okay. Uh, so next question, we have still three questions. So uh, a remark about the fact that in the C2 or Z2 maybe equivalent stable case, there is also big grading. So uh, the question is that, it, does this motivate an equivalent version of the layer classes and characteristic? Oh, I think there's a lot, lot of work done in that. Um, there, people have constructed um, equiver I mean, there's a construction, Hoywa's work talks explicitly about um, SHG. So you take some group and you look at G equivariant um, motivic stable homotopy theory. So this is uh, in there. And then people have, for C2 equivariant, people have constructed um, versions of real K theory and related it to Hermitian K theory. Um, so that's, that's definitely been done. I haven't uh, seen what these constructions of the Euler classes would do in that case, although there should really be a connection, especially because if you look at the C2 equivariant classical stable homotopy theory, that's very closely related to, there's a functor from the real, from SH of R to SH C2, where the, um, complex conjugation on a real scheme gives you the C2 action on the complex points. So that's how you map from um, SH over the reals to um, C2 equivariant classical stable homotopy theory. And there the signature comes up again because in fact, the grotendieck witt ring of the reals is exactly equal to the Burnside ring of C2, which is the endomorphism ring of the unit in the C2 equivariant theory. So there's a very close connection there. But um, other than those few trivial uh, comments, which I've lifted from other people, I don't know anything specific about it. Okay, so there's also a question about, so it says that in case of vector spaces of our field, the Euler characteristics always lands in the image of a ring of integers on the endomorphisms of K. And so the question is, is there a similar Phenomena in the motivic case? Ah, well, let's see. There is, let's see, there's a special ring where these things land. Well, we'll talk about computational methods. There is, um, yeah, let's put it this way. Um, we have the, the sort of technical problem is that we don't really know exactly what the endomorphism ring of the unit is over the integers. But, um, and we also don't quite know what K, so we can approximate that by KO of the integers. And if you invert two, we know exactly what that is. That's just the grotendieck witt ring of Z adjoin one half. And there's been a lot of work recently about trying to patch over this problem at two. So in, in fact, Bachman and Bickelgren mentioned this explicitly that if you, what one supposes that K over the integers is just the grotendieck witt ring of symmetric bilinear forms over the integers, then if you have any gadget which is um, unramified in whatever sense you like over the integers, then its corresponding degree of the Euler class or whatever quadratic invariant you calculate for it should land in the grotendieck witt ring of the integers. So for example, if you look at Euler classes of universal bundles on Grassmannians, and if they're of the right degree to take the degree, then you'd expect them to land in the grotendieck witt ring of the integers, which makes life easy because that's a very simple ring. It's just gotten by passing to the grotendieck witt ring of the reals, which you can detect everything. It's just detectable by the rank and the signature. So it would make a lot of calculations very easy. Uh, the current state of affairs is you get this up to 
um, a two torsion element, which comes from the one half in the Grodin in the Z adjoined one half. And then um, uh, Bachmann and Bickelgren say, okay, well, then we can just make explicit evaluations at other primes and eliminate this two torsion element by computing elementary invariants like discriminants. So, um, except for this minor fly in the ointment, I think that would be the analog that it doesn't land in the integers, it lands. So unramified classes would land in Grotendieck Bidring of the integers. And if you're, for example, if you had a hyperserv, uh, some, some projective variety over K, which comes from something which is smooth and projective over G, Z adjoined one over N, then you'd expect that the um, Euler characteristic would land in the Grotendieck Bidring of Z adjoined one over N, something like that. So, Okay. And it's, it's true, except at two, we're not quite sure, but it's expected. I think that's the, that's the an analogous answer. So there's the last question about, uh, uh, is there a formula uh, uh, expressing the Euler class of a vector bundle V over X in terms of say, the Euler characteristic of X and, uh, and V, or maybe to the Tom space of V or some other objects? Ah. In terms of the in terms of the Euler characteristic of X and the Euler characteristic of the Tom space, or of V, or well, the Euler characteristic of V is the same as the Euler characteristic of yeah. X. Although, if you take the Euler characteristic compact support, that's the Euler characteristic of the Tom space, I guess. Mm -hmm. So um, I hadn't thought about it, but it probably not because the point is that the Euler characteristic is essentially multiplicative. So when you're taking the Euler, and it also satisfies uh, cut and paste, or Meyer via torus. So when you take the Euler characteristic of the Tom space of V, let's say V has rank R, it just multiplies the Euler characteristic of the base space by this, by the Euler characteristic of uh, reduced projective space of a sphere, which is uh, minus minus one, no, which is um, minus one, right? The quadratic form minus one not the mm -hmm. number minus one. So it just multiplies by that quadratic form minus one raised to the rank of the vector bundle. So you don't really get any information about the Euler characteristic of the vector bundle. That's coming by looking at how the zero section sits inside the Tom space. That's really what it's given. That's the Euler, Euler class is gotten by that. And that's not given by the Euler class of the Tom space. Okay. So that's the end of the question, I guess. Thanks a lot, Mark.